Hey everyone, welcome to the Zelda Informer podcast, episode number eight. Uh, this week is interesting. Um, so we had a special guest who had to cancel on us literally at the last moment. My co-host canceled on me, although he canceled on me two days ago. He's on vacation. Thanks, Alfred. Um, <laughs> and then we also had another Zelda Informer member, our comic artist, uh, and other he does other art stuff for us at the website. Trey, who said he was going to be here and never showed up. So, this week, we have three people on the podcast, in addition to myself, your host. And these three people, I do not know them. They are fans of our website. They literally answered a plea on Twitter. Hey, can anyone do a podcast right now? <laughs> and these three people <laughs> stepped to the plate. Uh, so we got Watch Mason that. with us today. Say hi, Mason. Hey, what's up, guys? And then Kevin. Hey, everybody. What's up? And last but not least, Francisco. How you guys doing? Awesome. So as I was telling you before we started recording, thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm highly appreciative because without you guys, it would just be me. And let me tell you, our fans have other ways to watch just me if they that's what they want. Mm -hmm. Our pleasure. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get right into it here. Our first 30-minute segment, just reminding our, our listeners and viewers, if you're watching our video podcast, uh, this is select topics that happened because I chose them. So live with it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is actually some news that hit right before we were recording. Actually, it was a few, you know, it was like 12 hours ago. Uh, E.G. Aonuma apparently is the reason that Breath of the Wild was delayed. Uh, in a recent interview with Edge magazine, he stated this when he was talking about why Breath of the Wild was delayed. He said that we have these milestones during development. I play the game, then give staff my comments, my advice on what direction they should be heading in. At one of the milestones, the game was fantastic. There were so many great elements. But at the next milestone, that was all gone. I made a lot of comments about what they needed to add. But I never told them what I thought was good about the game at that milestone. So they added stuff that I would recommended. But they also added some other elements they thought would work well. And that ended up breaking all of the good parts of the previous build. I learned that when it's good, I have to say so. If I had managed that well, maybe development wouldn't have extended quite so much. All right. So we know back during E3, or at least I know, I don't know if you guys know, obviously, your fans, I have no idea how much you know. We'll find out. Um, but if you didn't know, Shigeru Miyamoto gave a reason during E3 as to why Breath of the Wild was delayed, stating that it had to do with the physics engine not being ready and needing more work. Uh, now we have the person who is actually in charge of the game telling us, well, it actually was my fault because I told them stuff, didn't tell them what was good, so they ended up changing elements of what was good, and they had to revert everything back. Uh, so the discussion point here is, you know... Is this an acceptable excuse to you uh, for why Breath of the Wild has now suffered two delays? Or three? Two, three? Something like I th that. I think three. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. 2015 to 2016. To 2017. 2017. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Maybe it was only two delays. Look, I mean, though, uh, am I going to go first in this topic? I suppose? Sure, go for it. All right, go, yeah. go for it. Well, I mean, the, the way I see it when it comes to delays, it doesn't care how many you do. Because they're delaying it for a good reason, right? Their intent is to create the best version of the game that they could possibly make. And as long as, sure. as, long as that's their intention, I don't care what the excuse is. If it's to fix the game and to make it as good as it can be, then I'm all for it. No, I, I definitely get, uh, get what you're saying there. I think for me, what I loved about this comment uh, is that he stated it publicly. That he's admitting that I screwed up. Like, Shigeru Miyamoto right. said his thing. Other people have said things. I stayed, you know, he stated in March of 2015 when they first delayed the game that it was to add new ideas to it. It turned out that, yeah, maybe it was to add new ideas, but there were ideas that should have already been implemented if he didn't screw up in the first place. Right. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, there was another quote back during E3. I don't know if it was from, I think it was from Shigeru Miyamoto, or it was Bill Trennan, one of the two. <laughs> and they said that uh, they decided about two years ago that this game was going to also come out on NX in addition to Wii U. And uh, at that time, two years ago, it would have been when they revealed Breath of the Wild, then just called The Legend of Zelda for Wii U. Uh, and it, they, they said several times, it'll be exclusive to Wii U, exclusive to Wii U. Obviously, it, it apparently back then, they knew it wasn't going to be exclusive. Uh, so I, I kind of look at it like this. If he didn't screw up, we would have probably gotten Breath of the Wild last year. And then they would have most likely remastered it for the NX in 2017. Um, that That's what I kind of get. So it's almost like I think he's apologizing to the public here. Right. Saying, I'm sorry that I screwed up. You should have had this game last year. Yeah. It's my fault. You could have it this year, but now we're so close to the NX release uh, that it doesn't make fiscal sense to release it three months before you're going to release it again. Mm. Well, um, I mean, the way you see it, he can apologize all he wants. At the end of the day, his apology is going to be Breath of the Wild itself. Because well, sure. if it if it turns out to be an amazing game, then all it's excused, it is all amazing. is great. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, just, just really good. Right. I, I don't even care. Okay, I, so obviously I was at E3. I got to play it like six times. Nice. Right. I don't care. I don't care if we ever get off the Great Plateau. Oh, yeah. The Great Plateau itself is so much fun that it's like a game in that of itself. I could it, I could yeah. explore that for oh. weeks. On yeah, oh yeah, awesome. definitely. It's insane how big it was, and that was like a very small portion of the actual yeah. game. Yeah, that was like one percent, right? Less than two percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah crazy. It, it, I think it's a little more than one percent, but they said they later said it was less than two percent. So fair um, enough. Um, and they were talking, they were just talking of the game's content. So some people took it to mean of the size of the world. They were just talking content wise. Well, I believe they also mentioned how it was 12 times bigger than Twilight yeah, Princess. Twilight, yeah, 12 times yes. bigger than Twilight Princess. That's, yeah. right, that's yeah. a big statement right there. That's yes. yeah. saying Bold. something. So, uh, Kevin. Yeah? You're, you're, you're sitting in front of AJ Nomo, and he's like, look, I screwed up. I delayed the game. Didn't want to admit it a year ago. I'm telling you now. How does it make you feel? I mean, I'm glad he's being honest now, and I can kind of understand why he may have wanted to wait to talk about it, but I think maybe some people wouldn't have been as mad about the delay if he had said that earlier. I think people would have been a little bit more forgiving about it. Yeah, that's true. I think, uh, you know, you bring up a point, you know, maybe people would have been more forgiving. I think they would have been less forgiving, to be honest. If he had said in March 2015, if he would have came out like, look, we're delaying the game the next year, we're delaying the game because I, I I screwed up, I made a mistake. It would uh, to me if if that came out at the time. And remember, they had just uh, I think it was just three months prior they had the video game awards uh, yeah, where they did is. their first like gameplay of the game. Granted, it was off screen footage, but mm-hmm. uh, it still happened. So like it seemed like they were consistently advertising the game. And gotta remember at that time they also said when he announced it, he said we're not going to be at E three either, um, which. Mm-hmm. That was a big shocker to people too. Like, oh, now you're not even going to have the game at E3, and it seems like it's because of everything that he screwed up. So if he had been like, "Look, I made a mistake, messed up, I screwed up the dev team," um, it might have made people not only lose faith in the game, it might have made people lose faith in in his ability to lead the game. Yeah, they might have viewed um, him as more incompetent. Yeah, like, yeah. It, mm. and, and he they to, knew at the time that it was going to be a negative reception to the delay. So maybe. You know, he didn't lie. I know some people have told me, oh, well, he lied. He didn't lie. They The game is delayed because they do have to add new features. But right. the reason they had to add those new features, he didn't want to disclose because I, I think he wanted to avoid, I don't know if it was scrutiny he was trying to avoid. Um, I don't know. That That's just the way I take it. Uh, based on what I remember from fans being all mad about it, I don't think they would have been any less mad if he would have been like, well, here's why it's delayed. I messed up. Well, I mean, um, they would have been happy he could admit to his mistake, but right, yeah, right. still would have been like, "But you've been how long have you been running Zelda for? I mean, 15, 16 years, right? Why, why are you still making this mistake?" But I mean, at, at the same time, like I'm, I'm a little fifty-fifty on that, on that opinion because yeah, I feel like that would have been a little bit of outrage, but once, like, once people would have saw what they actually saw at this most recent E3, 
I feel like they would have forgiven him. They would have been like, yeah, he screwed up, but he... Well, and he I fixed- think... Yeah. I, like, I think the reason they skipped E3 last year, now in hindsight, is because of his screw-up, all the elements that oh, yeah. were making that demo at E3 fantastic were screwed up and not ready. So they're like, well, we right. can't show it because it's not going to be what the game is going supposed to experience. Like, they, they did... It wouldn't have been the best presentation of what they wanted people to experience the first time they play it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, Mason, you got anything to add? I mean, I kind of agree with Kevin. I mean, it just depends on... Like, even how you said, how, like, why would he have not said something earlier? You know, people probably would have been a little more apologetic over it. But at the same time, it's like, why would you not tell your team that this game is not how you want it? Or, you know what I mean? It's sure. just like, why would you keep and hold all that back and let them, yeah, you're kind of giving them more creative, like, flow. But at the same time, you're limiting it also, you know? If you want everything sure. a certain way, and then once it gets done, it's like, wow, this isn't really what I was wanting. And then, of course, that pushes the game back even more. So, exactly. in my eyes, I'm like, I can see both situations, but I just feel like it could be a little... It could have been done a little bit better. I just feel like if it was a little bit earlier, he did mention something, people would be a little more understanding. Yeah. But it's been two years since... No. Yeah, two years since we've seen the game like yep. announced now, and it's insane. And, I mean, they've delayed games so many years, like Yoshi's Woolly World, not to like, get off topic, I'm just saying, like, oh, years and years, Nintendo you see Nintendo is it. infamous. For right, yeah, really. for real. Yeah, but... And Zelda, Zelda's no exception. Zelda yeah. almost always gets delayed. Yeah. Right. But that, I mean, that's exactly. something to be expected. Right, but that that's the thing about delaying their games, is that even though they do it, most of the time, it's worth it. And they right. did it for a good reason. Yeah. And, yeah. like, the game looks so good. Like, I mean, I sat on a computer and watched it, but I had the chance to go, but I didn't because yeah, that yeah. was all they were showing, and I didn't feel like it was flying all the way over there to California. It was worth it, you know. Probably but was I, I really end. regret not going. <laughs> Probably was I really regret not Okay, put it this way. Put it this way. My day job is Zelda Informer. Like, I'm paid to do this, and I don't know if it was worth it for me. Really? I, I, I paid $3,000 to go on that trip. Oh. Um I I'm mean, behind, I'm still behind on rent because of that trip. So, oh my god! It's, uh, don't get me wrong; it was fantastic. Like I'm wearing, you know, I'll try to show it on camera. I'm wearing my Breath of the Wild shirt. I got there. There's, I got my six coins for all six times I played it around your. Summer, I will but... buy one of those off of you. I'm just saying. I'm not <laughs> for real. I need it. Well, I mean, if you want to help pay my rent, I maybe I can give you the coin. <laughs> yes, sir. I got you. And, no, it's um, like it looks. I'm excited for it. Yeah, it, it definitely. Um, you know it. It's a one of a kind experience. I'll just put it that way. Right. Uh, I mean, and if people want to know, like, see some of my pl- gameplay, you can go to our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash Um And there's a whole bunch of like, I think right now we have a video over a hundred thousand views of me uh, defeating Step Talus, one of the Overworld bosses. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, from what commenters have said, like, I'm the only person they've seen who's beaten it who actually looks like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> um, well, you are I should Zelda also informer. I should also remind remind people that are watching it and think, oh, he knows what he's doing. That's like the third time I've killed him, so I, I kind of had it mastered by then. Mm. Um, plus I knew like a whole bunch of cool moves like shield surfing and stuff that a lot of people on the show floor didn't know how to do. Right. I mean, um, that's the main thing about the Breath of the Wild that like took me off guard was just how surprising the amount of support and like sort of praise it was getting, right? Because usually, like, when Zelda's at E3 or whatever, you know, you get, like, n- the Nintendo fans on it. You were getting people from sure. from all walks of life looking yeah, at Breath like, of the Wild as, like, this right. sensational thing. It it, right. it, it blew everyone with, away. With at five least from hour waiting like. lines. Yeah. It, it, had, <laughs> it had everyone excited. Not just Nintendo fans. And that's what surprised me the most. And that's what made it worth it, and, like, in my eyes, in terms of, like, delaying it, is that, like, it was unlike anything anyone has ever seen before. Sure, sure. Um, so, I'll hopefully, uh, our, our listeners and viewers, uh, you kind of got both sides of the coin there. Like, you could see, like, he screwed up, so we could have got this game a lot sooner, so you can be mad at him if you want. Um, but, hey, he's manning up to it. Hopefully, he learned. And Definitely. since he's still the producer of the Zelda series, uh, he will probably still be in charge of the Zelda series when the next console game comes out that, uh, yeah, he probably is never going to make that mistake again. Uh, so, moving on to our second topic. So, 
I know the whole world is still enamored with Pokemon Go. Oh boy. Uh, yep. But but yep. something you know, Pokemon Go was technically technically over a week ago. So we talked about that on our last podcast. Uh, something else happened this past week. It feels like forever ago, but it really isn't. Nintendo announced the Nintendo Classic Edition. Yes. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I hate, you know, saying this, but Zelda Informer does not have a post that has all the information about it in one post. So you guys can go to, I'll put a link down in the description as well. I have a, I put a summary post up on my, like my website, a site I own, nintendoprime.com. Um, I'll put a link down there if people want to go check that out and get everything you want to know about it. But here's the basic rundown of what this thing is. Uh, it is... Like, if you go to Walmart and you see, like, those uh, video game packs for, like, Atari or whatever, the plug-and-play video game packs, that's what this is. It is a mini box that looks like an NES that you that fits in the palm of your hand. It's got an HDMI out. It has a USB power. Uh, so I'm assuming you could – it'll come with a power cord, I'm assuming, but you could probably use any other USB power cords that you have. Uh, it has – let me see. I'm thinking. It's got 30 games. And the games are like not shovelware. They're they're all from the NES era, and they are some of the very best games from that era, uh, including for you know our Zelda viewers out there, our Zelda fans, t- the two Zelda games that came out on NES. So that would be the Legend of Zelda and the Adventure Link. Uh, it does not. Well, they don't know if it's going to support scanline mode yet. Uh, it, I'm guessing it's not. They're just going to have it look as crisp as it possibly can on your HD TV. And yeah, that's really it. There's no internet connection. There'll never be future updates or more games added. Fine by me. That's just what it is. It, it it is a collection pack of classic NES titles, and they're not just Nintendo games. Like there's Final Fantasy, I think I saw on there. Uh, so there's some third party games in there. And here's the kicker: it only costs sixty dollars in that's the United re- States. That's that really is. good. Quite the deal, I say. Um. Oh, and I forgot to talk. The controllers for it, they are uh, basically replicas of NES controllers, but they are not NES controllers. So, like, you can't use your old NES controllers with it. It's not oh. compatible. Um, but what it what they did do, if you actually look at the connector spot, the connector spot is the same connection spot you use on a Wiimote on the back end. So you can use the NES uh, – I'm sorry, the Nintendo Classic Edition controllers – uh, with your Wii Motes on NES games on your Wii and Wii U, uh, and you can also conversely for Player Two uh, use the Pro Controller and the Classic Controller or Classic Controller, Classic Pro Controller. I don't know. They have so many different controllers they released in that Wii era, uh, but two of those controllers that you would use for classic games, like for for Super Nintendo games and NES games, you can use on this system. So the cross compatible nice. uh, only for Player Two. Player one always has to use the, for some reason. I don't know why, but it's the same connector, but whatever. The Player one always has to use the Nintendo Classic Edition controller that I assume comes with the console. Okay. Um, oh, and to get another Nintendo Classic Edition controller, it's like 20 bucks. A um, little pricey for a replica NES controller, but... For the uh, thing being sixty dollars, though, it's not really yeah. That's, terrible. Not, I mean, that's I mean, if you me. think about it, for sixty bucks, forget the fact that it's a plug and play system. You can't even right now go on the eShop and buy all thirty of those games for sixty bucks. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, which has some yeah. people upset because now, like, okay, so you can sell these games cheap, so why can't <laughs> I do that on the eShop? Yeah. Well, f- <laughs> I was gonna say, for me, it's like. I have never bought any digital games. I mean, I have some, but it's not, I don't have a collection <laughs> of them. So, I mean, for me, it's like, I was born in 1997, so I wasn't really around for the NES era. Damn. But this thing is adorable. It fits in the Youngin. palm of your hand. And it's Youngin. amazing. Youngin. Like, <laughs> when you see all the eShop games and stuff, it's like, like for example, like, whatever. You know what I mean? Any of the 30 on sure. that list. They're sure. like seven, eight, nine bucks. And it's like, yeah, that's a okay deal, I guess, but... We didn't go out in a few months even and just buy this thing for 60 bucks and have all the ones you pay like 154 total maybe. I, I view this console in, uh, in, in two ways because I, I've been going back and forth with some fans about um, the viability of the console um, and like why it, it exists when there's already ways to get these games legally. Plus there's people talking about all the illegal ways you can get it. Just, just to squash that in the bud, 
you cannot compare a legal way to obtain something to an illegal way to obtain something. And yes, you can legally create ROMs, and no, it's not as easy as a plug-and-play system, so it is not comparable. Um, plus, you have to actually own the NES games to create your ROM. And have you been on the NES game used game market? They're expensive. expensive. Yes, like very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, they're, so just, they're considered it vintage. Not, it, it's just not even worth comparing. Uh, but so to get to my the points I was trying to make, I just wanted to admit, put that on the side because I'm tired of hearing that argument from fans. Um, sorry, your ROMs and emulators are not the same thing. Uh, it, it, okay. So I think, I I think you guys from the brief time I've talked to you are pretty reasonable and can kind of agree that the Wii U has been a sales failure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, For the most part. You might, you might love the Wii U. Like I love the Wii U. I think it has a fantastic library. It's like my second favorite Nintendo console next to the Super Nintendo. But it hasn't been a success financially or sales wise for the most and part they the <laughs> a lot of people uh bought like vc games on it and that's fine you get your virtual console games that's great but not a lot of people own that system anymore people that got virtual console games on the wii don't really play their wii anymore right uh, and plus like there's that old like their universal account system isn't really a universal account system um and like if you transfer your wii games to your wii u like it's in a separate boot mode and it's just not fun uh this console is for people who one aren't heavily invested in the virtual console and two don't already own a wii u to play these games on it is not for people who own a wii u and have already bought you know over half of these games like that's not what this console is for this is tapping into well my generation, I guess, uh, or the generation from the 90s that grew up uh, playing like NES games. Uh, you know, as an example, I'm going to buy this system not for myself. I have all like most of these games, either in the original format for NES or on Virtual Console. Or in, uh, yeah, Virtual Console, I think I actually own the Zelda games on both 3DS and Wii U. Like, I, for some reason, paid for them twice. I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, but. The system I'm going to buy is going to be for my kids. Because my kids, I, I, I've had them try to play NES games. Forget that, you know, they're fairly difficult compared to, like, phone games that, that my kids yeah. play. But what what actually makes it so hard for them is they can't hold the gamepad. They can't hold the Pro Controller comfortably. Um, Their hands are too small. Right, NES yeah. controllers, for some reason, this is the brilliance of NES controllers. They fit all hand sizes. It's crazy. Uh, and I'm going to get them this system so when they uh, want to start playing, like, Dad, I want to play that Breath of the Wild Zelda game because they know about Zelda games. My, you know, I got a daughter who's five, a son who's three. They love watching me play Zelda, but they want to play, and they just can't do it because they can't get their hands on the buttons. Mm. Uh, even though, even like using like Twilight Princess or the Wiimote and stuff, like, even that, like it's hard for them to grasp two different things, two different hands. So they will be enamored with this system. It is a way for me to get them into the games I grew up with cheaply and in a way that's going to be comfortable for them. Yeah, I mean... Plus, I don't have to worry about them going online with it and getting someone swearing at them. Yeah, like, or something I, like don't, I don't see why anyone would ever be against this. Like, sure, it might not be totally necessary, but who cares about whether or not it's necessary? It's It's... Yeah, it's, it's I, I think it's the negativity, fun. right? Like, the negativity towards it is mostly, I guess, from what I've seen. Um, it's the internet being the internet. People, really. It's people thinking. It, well, it's people thinking that Nintendo is relying on. Um, I, I think it's people. Okay, there's a large group of Nintendo fans that are Wii U owners that are upset at Nintendo the fact that they don't have really any more Wii U games coming except for Paper Mario, and that bothers them. It. it, it you know, whatever. This is the final year of the Wii U and the final year of almost every Nintendo console ever released has no games because they stopped making games so they can make games for the new console. That's just what Nintendo does. I don't agree with that. I think it's stupid, yeah. too. I'm right with you guys being mad about that. Yeah, I do. But, yeah. but the people that are mad at Nintendo about that are then mad about this because they think Nintendo is trying to make up um, not having games for that by relying on their retro-ness. Like, 
okay, retro gaming's in. Let's rely on it. Let's cash grab off of it. And to be fair, Nintendo is a business. Everything they do is intended to make money. Um, so that Wii U that you own, um, they plan to make money off of that. doesn't mean they did, but they were planning to. They didn't release it planning for it to fail. And I don't. I think people that have that attitude are looking at this all wrong. Okay, so we have to look at what Nintendo's been doing lately. Uh, Pokemon Go just released. Now, granted, Nintendo deserves very little credit for that game. Um, they basically just okayed it and threw some money at Niantic, and they took Ingress, put a Pokemon skin on it, and it's blowing up the world. Uh, but Nintendo does get money from that. So Nintendo figured it would be pretty popular. It's more popular than I think anyone thought it would be. Definitely. And they're making making bank off Definitely. that. They This is coming off an Definitely. E3 in which Nintendo... Uh, was really bold. They did not have a Nintendo Direct. They did not have a digital presentation. They did not have um, a press conference. It was, we're at E3. We'll do a live stream. We'll talk about like Pokemon and Zelda. Uh, I think they there's a couple other games. I can't even remember. Monster Hunter. And they Monster had Mario Hunter. Party Star Rush. And, yeah, and yeah. Joke I watched too. There you go. And See, I didn't, get to, I didn't get to watch the streams live. So, of course, you guys know more than me. Um, although, I did watch them after. But that was for an E3 bet special. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I, I was looking for certain things. I really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. Uh, anyways, so Nintendo did that. And then on the show floor, it was just Zelda. It was just Breath of the Wild. If you were at Nintendo's booth, you were there for one reason and one reason only. And it's crazy because no platform holder has ever done that in the history of video games at pretty much any conference ever where they just come with one game and that's all you get. And despite that, that one game was so good that it has single-handedly dominated all the E3 awards, all the E3 coverage. It is the game everyone was talking about at E3 because that's just how good it was. So Nintendo had all this positive press from that. They have even more positive press from Pokemon Go. Yes, there's been some negative press where people are being idiots and walking in front of cars or Not people using the app to like... Like people are using the app to like rob people. Like okay, but that's not that's not anyone's fault really. Outside of the person playing the game being stupid, right? Um, for a lot of that, I'm not saying the people that got robbed in the parking lot were necessarily their fault, but uh, people. A lot of the bad stuff happening is just people being idiots. Like if you're using Pokemon Go, watch where you're walking. <laughs> it says uh, it right the only when you open up the app. I feel really bad about. I don't even feel that bad about the robbery one because they caught the people who did the robbing stuff and they got all their stuff back. Um, okay. I feel bad about the guy who there was like that guy. These two teens were parked outside of a house, and some guy started shooting at them. Yes. Thinking, oh yeah. Like, that, oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And the thing is, that's not Pokemon Go's problem. That's the person that decided that a proper reaction to people who aren't even on your property <laughs> is to shoot at them because they look suspicious. I mean, look. I don't care. Like, they, it, like I don't care who you like. I, I, maybe that's a bigger problem with America. Like, I I'm not against like people having guns, but man, like people like that shouldn't be allowed to have guns. Like that's if they're in your house, fine. If they're on your lawn, give them a warning before you shoot them. You know that they're my, in their car parked on the side of the road. Like, God. my thing is like, Ugh. no matter what type of day it was. I mean, there's two teenagers sitting in a car in front of your house. Sure, but. You've got to know that late in the game. It was like four or five days after the sure. thing came out. Right. You've got to know everybody is playing this. You've seen it on Facebook. I guarantee that man probably well, it doesn't had a mean, Facebook. I mean, it Twitter could have been someone and... who doesn't use Facebook or social media. Well, like, true. Believe it or not, I mean, there's like a whole generation of people that don't, they're not plugged in like the rest right. of Right. Yeah, they do. But even like a newspaper yeah, do or nothing. news on TV, they've talked about it there yeah, too. Yeah, it's, it's been like everywhere. Yeah. I mean, in the very off chance you haven't heard about it, I mean, yeah, maybe be suspicious, but don't shoot at the people. Like for yeah. real, like yeah, there are a couple of teenagers. And that's the thing. They were teenagers too. Like, yeah. were, how threatening could the teenagers really? Right. Look? You have a gun. They don't. How, how threatening do they really look? Yeah, but I mean, uh, like, anyways, it's either. Anyways, okay. let's yeah, get yeah, back. Yeah. Let's Whatever. get back to the, the point. Yeah. I was so, for the most part, it's been pretty positive for Nintendo, and their stock has gone way up. Uh, in fact, I think the last thing I read on their stock was it's at it's as high as it was back in 2010, which. Uh, awesome. Although that was coming down from where it was in 2008, 2009, that was still really high compared to like all other generations of systems beyond the Wii and DS. Anyways, so their stocks uh, rising from that. Then they announced the NES Classic, which I admit the NES Classic is for a niche crowd. It is for people who want retro games for cheap. 
They want to play it with, over HDMI cleanly. And uh, people who maybe, like me, want to introduce your kids to retro games um, as like a cheap Christmas present or something. Um, did, you know, I don't know. I already explained why I'm, why I'm going to get one for my kids. And it, it, Nintendo knows that it's receiving a lot of flack for having no Wii U games. But if you're upset thinking that this is like Nintendo's just relying on the retro disc, the NX is still coming, guys. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's still a thing. It's it's coming, according to Nintendo, barring any delays. And as we talked about earlier, Nintendo loves delays. Uh, it's coming, and it is coming early next year, three months into the year, I believe. Yeah, I think it was sometime in March. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like March. <laughs> three months in the year. March 2017, at some point that month, NX is coming. Later this year... With all this momentum, Nintendo's going to be having some sort of press conference, some sort of something going on to announce NX. So like, they have all this momentum, and we might it, it might be happening in September. So we could be looking, say Pokemon Go starts trending down a little bit. September hits, boom, NX. Look, this week, it's not just Breath of the Wild. Look at all these games we have. Pokemon Go NX. Um, plus, <laughs> after after they're done with the, that, it's like, okay, cool, they announced NX, now they're advertising some games. Heading Sunshine the HD, I'm calling it. Then Pokemon Sun and Moon hits. Yeah. Like oh, Nintendo yeah. has, has like even with the lack of Wii U games, they have a whole bunch of stuff happening. They have a plan. E three through the end of the year that's going to make people excited about what Nintendo is doing. Yeah. And so so just slow down. Yes, they've abandoned the Wii U because the Wii U failed, and there's no point for them to keep pressing and pressing and pressing games to it when it's not working. It's not making them money. However, they have found other ways to make money, other ways to be relevant without the Wii U, and the NX is still a thing. Like, Nintendo didn't abandon console gamers. It's got at least one more crack at this, and I'm excited. We'll see what happens. So that, uh, that actually is going to end our save. I did have one more topic I was going to talk about. Um, I'll just briefly mention it uh, in case people aren't aware. Eiji Nomu is going to be or, or has been asked by Nintendo to make a new IP. Uh, that's exciting. Apparently, he has an idea Ooh. about um, growing up as a thief. Uh, some people have speculated that that it's would be like a Ganondorf thing because he's the king of thieves. But yeah. um, when I hear it's new just... IP, I think not, not Zelda. Yeah, Zelda yeah. because not that's Zelda. not a like, not a spinoff. That's not no a new way. IP. That would be a spinoff game. Yeah. So right. um, so we'll see if anything comes from that. You know, maybe that he just do the thing he says and nothing ever happens. But that would be great. Ijino was taught for years about wanting to do his own thing. Um, but the general topic was going to be about his role in the Zelda series moving forward. I will bring that up in a future podcast. Uh, so we just have one more segment. We're going to cover some fan topics. Uh, we're going to skip the last segment. I already explained to these people ahead of time. I'm on a tight schedule. Um, and because I had to do all this all last minute, it's just, you guys don't care. Let's just get to those fan topics, shall we? (laughs) <laughs> all right <laughs> and i'll try not to talk at least you're honest time. so i uh, so this is gonna be fun because we have fans here talking about topics that other fans brought up so this should be this should be entertaining um so from our facebook page i think so far everything i have is from our facebook page i don't think anyone responded on twitter uh aiden edge church uh he says that difficulty options should they be implemented for more hardcore gamers and i'm assuming he's talking about zelda games I'm going to shut up on this, and I'll let you guys talk. Let's start with uh, Mason. All right, yeah, I have a little opinion on this because I'm t- I'm a little new to Zelda. The first game I got for the franchise was Wind Waker HD, and I think it was 2013. Mm-hmm. So it was um, nice. it was new to nice. me, and I loved it. It was like it's like one of my favorite Wii U games ever. Great game, and not that there was many, but you get my point. And uh, after that, I got A Link Between Worlds, and I started getting older ones, like A Link to the Past, and games like that, A Link Between Worlds, etc. Um, not that that's old, but you get what I'm saying. And now with this, it's like, I'm not very experienced, but I know a little bit of what I'm doing. So it's like, I feel like a difficulty rank system kind of thing, like easy, medium, hard, you know. Um, for hardcore people, if they want to go full force, like I know they have a hard mode and like sums all the games and stuff where you have like so many hearts and you can, you know, but it's like now I feel like it would be good because there are younger people that would probably want to try this and stuff. And me two years ago, I had no clue what to do. I'm terrible at like puzzle games like that. Um, so it's like, I wouldn't know where to go or how to get to this spot, you know? 
So I think it would be a good idea. Uh, I think it's a good thing that, that it said they did at it. It would be interesting to see the like a uh, kind of the output, see how people actually feel about sure. it. Sure, I'm glad you brought up that there's hard modes because you're a new fan of the series and you know about hard modes. Now, to be fair, hard modes have only been around, I believe, since uh, Skyward Sword. Well, I'll create time. Oh, the you get but... uh, yeah the the Master Quest version of Ocarina of Time right. that released on the disc with um that you could get with uh the Wind Waker. Plus, then there was the Master Quest in Ocarina of Time 3D, yeah. which was technically harder. Uh, right. but in terms of like a new game that featured one, yes, yeah, Skyward Sword is starting. Yeah. So it actually yeah. is like a new thing. Like these hard modes are not. So it is possible that for if for some reason he hasn't played any game from Skyward Sword on, that he doesn't know that there already is a difficulty option. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a limb here and say that Aiden Edge Church here knows about hard modes and hero modes. He knows they exist. So I'm gonna assume when he says difficulty options, he means not what those do, because those don't actually do anything but affect the damage modifiers. Right. Well, sometimes, sometimes they yeah, flip the exactly. world, but that's it's not the same thing. Like it's it's just increasing the damage you take. It doesn't actually make the AI any harder. It doesn't right. increase the enemy count, uh, which would be basically the two big things you could do is make the AI, you know, make, make the openings to hit them a lot more difficult and have them be a lot more aggressive. I and know have if, more of them. Oh yeah. Oh sorry. I was gonna say I know if they did do that, it would be interesting because I know like a series like Mario Party has stuff like that, like that easy, which is very simple yeah. and then very hard. It's like oh my gosh, how are you so good at this? But it would be cool to see that. I mean, it's something that would be new to all of yeah. us, of course, and it would be interesting to see how it ends. Yeah, and and so, that's and yeah. that's and that's the thing too is that I'm actually playing Twilight Princess Hero Mode right now, and you know, just because I'm taking double damage and no hearts are spawning, that doesn't necessarily mean it's more difficult, right? Because every single battle that I get into with an enemy is basically the same thing. What I picture, right. what I picture when I see, when I you know, when I think of hard mode in a particular Zelda game, I'm thinking more enemies and smarter enemies. So, for example, like in Twilight Princess and, and Hyrule Field, right, you have a few enemies scattered about in this huge plane. When I picture hard mode, I'm thinking there are just tens, maybe hundreds of enemies just scattered all over the world, ready to hunt you down. But just because it's hero mode, there's still just a few enemies here and there that are kind of just doing their own thing. And, and like... For some of that, I, I can understand that maybe they don't increase the enemy count so drastically because the hardware can't handle it. Um, and obviously, right. we saw the Hyrule Warriors. They could handle you know all those enemies, but those enemies' AI are nothing. Right. Yeah. They're just they're just paper. <laughs> so outside of obviously those, some of the bosses and stuff, but even then, you know, they limit how many of those can be on the screen at one time. And I, I think you look at it like when, when I think of a difficulty mode, if the, if they would do it and. I, just so that everyone knows, I am for there being difficulty options. I've been for it for a yeah, long time. Me too. Me too. I've been there isn't for a while. there isn't really a negative to difficulty options. If you don't want them, then just play the game on normal. Yeah. It it's yeah. going to be the experience you would have got without them, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. But uh, when I think difficulty options, I think taking that AI and making it better. Like, just yeah. making it more aggressive. Um, as an example, in Breath of the Wild, if they, like, the AI in Breath of the Wild is extremely smart, but it's also a little slow at times. And that's for the benefit of the player, because you're getting your grips on the world. And obviously, this is the very beginning part of the game, so they're not going to have it overly difficult regardless. But it, it's one of those where if I'm thinking of, oh, let me play on the hardest mode possible for this game, it would mean that the enemies would respond quicker i wouldn't be able to sneak up on them um very easily because they literally hear my footsteps in the grass um versus right now where you have like that quiet meter and oh if it's quiet enough they don't hear you like no 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 no. in real life if i hear someone walking in tall grass i hear them like yeah. you can't hide right. your footstep uh, or you can't hide it very well so it'd be more, like make that more aware of what's going on, make them more aggressive. Like there's times that you could lock onto an enemy and it still takes them, you know, three, four, five seconds before they attack you. Like in real life, they're probably just gonna club you and go after you. Like I've I've seen brawls, man. Like there is no waiting period. It's nope. just they go at you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's what I think of in the hardest mode. Like they're more aggressive. Maybe they do slightly more damage. And on top of that, they're a lot smarter in their attack yeah. patterns and. 
um, just the general AI. And Zelda hasn't done that. Yeah. I don't think it's going to and do I mean, that. I think it should I'll happen. Be, yeah, it should happen. Uh, as a, a, long time as a matter of it. fact... As a matter of fact, that's actually what what The Last of Us does with, with its difficulty. It says right there. It sure. says you know exactly. you, take, you take right you take triple damage, and the AI is way more aggressive. It literally says it right right when you pick it. Yeah, yeah exactly. That and, might be in charge series with the crushing. Yeah. Right, and I and I, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I kind of feel like they drew a little bit of, of inspiration from The Last of Us, and at least when, when it comes to music in Breath of the Wild. Because, sure. And I look at it like this: All, over the years playing Zelda games. Fans have found a way to make the games more difficult. And that's not how we should achieve our difficulty. Um, Three heart challenges are awesome. They're amazing, um, especially in Twilight Princess Hero Mode with the Ganondorf Amiibo. So you have 4x damage, doing a three heart run. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's impressive stuff because it basically means if you could do that without dying throughout the whole run, it means you never got hit, which that's great. Like, that's crazy that you just never once made a mistake and got hit. Or fell off a cliff or something. Uh, but that's the fans making the game difficult. And they're making it difficult, again, through damage. Instead of instead of damage modifiers, it's, well, we don't have as much life, so we can't take as many hits. So we can make less mistakes. But it doesn't actually make the game more difficult. And the fact that three heart runs are very, very popular that it, it just to tell nintendo that hey difficulty options are good like veteran zelda gamers want a more difficult game and you could still keep the easy mode for you know the kids exactly. and the, the new gamers yeah. who don't who aren't comfortable you know like growing up i i used to play like doom and quake and there's difficulty modes in that and i would always hop in the extreme mode and i would get wrecked and then i'd end up beating the game on easy Right. Because it wasn't for me. I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't enjoy the game being that difficult. But there were many people that did. Um, so it's kind of a way to cater to everyone. So I don't. It, yeah, I mean, exactly. It is. Thinking. It is more difficult. It is because the programming wise, you, you know, you, it's not just one AI. You have to alter the AI. Like I get that it is harder to do, but do it. Yeah, it'd be yeah. worth it in the it's, long yeah, run. It's, though. It's, it's totally worth exactly. it. Exactly. It allows you to appeal to more people. Yeah. Which right, so here's a. Uh, we're going to move on to our, our, our next fan. We could talk about this probably for a whole podcast. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, difficulty is obviously something that all gamers care about. Uh, whether you want the options or not, we all have opinions. Uh, so Megan Perry from our Facebook page, they want to know what is our favorite music pieces from the Zelda series Ooh. or any video game series if you'd like to expand past Zelda. Mm. Uh, let's let Kevin start with this one. All right. Um I like Men of Lament a lot in Twilight Princess. Right. Very good. I love that. And actually, the Zelda's Mobile Body and Skyward Sword is just amazing. I love it. It's finally yes. orchestrated, but it's so good. So nice. Um, I'm a huge, uh, besides Zelda, I love Kingdom Hearts, so I can't I love the music in that. And Final Fantasy, of course. Nice. Uh, uh, Francisco, what's your favorite piece of music in the Zelda series? Oh, man. Okay. Um... I'm going to have to say, okay, there's a particular song in Twilight Princess that's literally just called Twilight Princess. That was, that, <laughs> that, that, I'm, I know, it's strange. I know what you're talking strange about. Strange title, but that yeah, would have, that would have to be it because it's a mix of just, it's, te it's telling a story in and of itself and sure. it's just eerie and it's powerful and it gets you every single time. Other than Zelda, my two favorites other than Zelda would have to be the music in The Last of Us, and also a game called Jesuit Radio Future. Okay, that soundtrack okay. is absolutely Good. amazing. Good soundtrack in that game, uh, Mason. What do you got? All right. Well, I mean, the Twilight Princesses are obviously good music pieces, but uh. I mean, games from that are good, but I think Wind Waker. Like I said, that was my first Zelda game. So it's like, I have yeah, kind of a nostalgic feel for it already. I was hoping you were going to bring up Wind Waker. Yeah. Cause, yeah, you know, Wind Waker it, very, it very rarely makes like people's favorite, like their favorite song in the whole series. Oh, no. But God, yeah. the Wind Waker's overall soundtrack is... Oh, like, yeah. the, I know. Like, the, like the final battle with Ganon, I love that theme. In it. Yeah. Oh, definitely. No, I... I like the open ocean, like whenever you're sailing and stuff. Yeah, it's that's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's so captivating, you know. It gets you, it sucks you into the adventure <laughs> aspect, which right. is really great. Yeah, but nice. then also Dragon Roost Cavern, it's it, I love that too. Okay, oh yeah. Cool. But yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Other what's your than, favorite non Zelda? 
Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I know a lot of people really like Mario Galaxy music, and I do like that too. But I'm thinking that. like Super Mario 64 era, like sure, the, that you, game in specific, because yeah. dude, um, it's uh, that was my first game actually. So it's like, yeah, me too. It's actually. a lot of memories. Like you remember going to this level and hearing this sound when you were in this yeah. area and all sure. this stuff. And it's, it's a, like it's got a nice nostalgic feel. Yeah, too. exactly. The song. And, the song. By the way, by the way, oh my God, the song nostalgia for is not a negative. No, please, no. like people who keep <laughs> acting like it's you all that like it because nostal- like okay, nostalgia is good. So, shut up. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, n- nostalgia literally means that like it it exists because something impacted you so much when you were younger yeah. that it sticks with you today, and that's yeah. that's why the like the little mini NES is a good thing. It's Nintendo capitalizing not only on nostalgia but on the opportunity to have. A brand new audience get you know exposed exactly to and yeah the people want so it much. there's enough people excited for it that if it's not for you it's okay exactly they don't have to make everything they do for you um anyways uh this is hard for me when i because i've been playing zelda basically since i was born i'm 30 years old the zelda series is 30 years old uh i m- my first experience with it was when i was five and i have been in love with the Zelda series forever. I played all the games multiple times. Uh, I don't play them multiple times as much as I've gotten older because I have three kids and a lot going on. So it's hard for me to find the time. But I, I will beat a Zelda game at least one time now. Uh, and when I say beat it, I mean like 100% the game. Yep. Um, yep. Because, yeah. because like if I 100% the game, I don't feel like I have to go back and replay it because I don't have the time to do that. So I have time. To, I have time to do that one time because it's for my job. Um, I, I do get the live stream once in a while, so I'll get to play the game again. But I'm not going to 100 percent it. Anyway, so uh, it, it's hard for me because I my favorite game in the series is The Adventure of Link, and there's so many music pieces I love from that game. There's obviously the Zelda theme, the actual theme song for the whole series that started on the first Zelda game. Right. Um, that that's a, you know that's obviously a, a big important one. But right. you know, Midna's Lament was brought up. Like that's fantastic. I love Wind Waker's soundtrack. I love Minish Cap's soundtrack a lot too. Uh, but I keep thinking, what song really that I just I heard it in game. I went and found it online, played it on repeat several thousand times. And for me, I don't know what it's called makes me mad that I don't know what it's called because when I play it on repeat, I actually go to one of our videos of that game on our YouTube channel to do it. So I don't actually know the name of it. But it is the song in Spirit Tracks. And during the final boss fight, when you go into the final part of it, yeah. when all the different instruments from the different sages all come together, along oh, with yeah. you playing your pan flute, yeah. it is... Like, this is on a DS. So, like, the sound quality isn't that great. It doesn't matter. That music piece, that singular piece is a masterpiece. Dude, I honestly think that Spirit Tracks is one of the most underappreciated, if not the most underappreciated exactly. Zelda game there is. It was yeah. fun. It was fun. It was I don't know so why people good. don't like it. Was it was better than Phantom Hourglass. It was such a step well, up from Phantom Hourglass, I, yeah. I mean, maybe. maybe. Phantom Hourglass just made, made, Phantom Hourglass sold so well, maybe. But, like, people are like, yeah, but this isn't good. So we're not going to buy Spirit Tracks. <laughs> it's got trains. It's got trains, everybody. Um, <laughs> Phantom Hourglass So, yeah, that's my, my favorite. That's Zelda my game. absolute favorite uh, Zelda music piece is that one. Like, I, I don't know. Probably, I don't know anyone else that would probably agree with me. Because uh, there's just so much. Like, the Dark World theme from Link to the Past is amazing, too. Yeah. yeah. But, like, that's the piece that sticks with me. I still play that piece to this day. And our timer has ran out. So I'm just going to get my last one in. And this is my favorite non so and this might tell you, you know, I am 30, so I tend to prefer older games. And well, that's not true. Actually, I prefer playing newer games, but I like some things from older games. And I'm calling out the moon theme from DuckTales. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That is to I me one of the single best music tracks I think's ever been made in all the video games. And what's weird is it's totally misplaced in that level. It should be it should be the song for the credits or the song for the final stage in that game, but it's not. It's like level two. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It is so good. It like transcends gaming to me. Uh, it's just 
Oh, yeah, it's so good. No, that's that's how that's um, that's how I feel about just a Radio Future soundtrack. It's just so, it goes with anything. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna kind of wrap things up here a little bit. Um, as I said, we're not doing our final segment because I'm crunched for time because. As I already explained, a whole bunch of people skipped out on the podcast. I want to thank Mason, Kevin, and Francisco for joining me this week. Uh, it's thank been you. fantastic. If this all goes well and all the quality is good, hey, maybe you guys will end up on a future one. We'll see. For sure. We'll see what um, happens. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I'd, I'd be down. I would love to, get, you know, love to get you guys in on a full episode so you can get the full experience, especially with my co-host here. Definitely. Of course. It, it makes a big difference. I miss you, Alfred. I miss you. Um, God damn it, Alfred. All right, so <laughs> you can go ahead and subscribe to Zelda Informer on YouTube if you want. It's obviously YouTube.com slash Zelda Informer. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Zelda Informer, Facebook Zelda Informer. If you kind of get it, look for Zelda Informer anywhere. We're there. We're on Instagram. We're on Google+. Uh, we're on, even on Tumblr. Like, Just look up Zelda Informer. We're everywhere. We're always playing Zelda, talking about Zelda. Uh we also this podcast our audio only version. If you're uh, listening on video, will be uh, will be down in the description as well. We do we host that on Podbean, but you can also get it on iTunes. We don't have it on a native thing for Android yet. I haven't really sorted that out. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just being honest. So if you know what you're doing and you know how I can get it easily to Android devices, let me know and I'll figure it out. Uh, yeah. Thank you for joining. You can follow me at Nate Chance. You guys want to throw out some social media stuff for yourselves? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, my YouTube is Mason of Delfino. I make a lot of Nintendo content. So if you like that, head over there. It's really cool. So, yeah. Nice. Kevin, you got anything? Yeah, my YouTube and Twitter are both Kevin Triforce. I do a lot of Zelda stuff, Nintendo stuff in general, and some music stuff as well. Sweet. Francisco. Um, Twitter, I'm at 55, the baseman 55. Uh, don't follow me because I really just stuff about competitive Call of Duty and it has nothing to do with Zelda, so don't follow me at all. Yeah, just don't. Follow I, was, me. I was reading your Twitter, uh, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, no, it, it's kind of like you're just a media head. Yeah, no, just don't, don't bother, don't follow me at all. Don't just, bother. Yeah. Don't. No, Here's my please. Twitter handle. Well, please don't follow. Me. Just don't, just don't do it. He does nothing interesting, nothing interesting, no, <laughs> nothing at all. I just, I just retweet, just, just crazy stuff. Just don't do it. Bad. You should just be retweeting Zelda for me all the time. Well, other than that. <laughs> There's there's a few exceptions here and there, but for the most part, don't. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, our three guests. Thank you, our listeners. It's been fun. It's been real. I got a movie to go to, so I'm out. Peace. Peace. Later, guys. Later, guys. Bye.